Hello, Falta. Welcome to another episode of the Tonbo Coolnia with myself, Laura O'Brien. And we are working through Joseph Dunn's translation of the Tonbo Coolnia or the Cattle Raid of Cooley. And this is the one that is easily accessible, or one of the ones that's easily accessible, but probably the best of them um, on online, which is why we're working through it. The language is a little bit flowery, a little bit difficult at times, but um, I'm reading through it and trying to provide some context. So if, if this is your first time here for some reason, and you're kind of jumping in to episode 17C of the Thon Bokulnia, the appearance of Ku Cullen is where we're working on today, and we're going to cover Dove Talk's jealousy as well. Um, if you're just jumping in, then it definitely would be worth going back. And I know that looks like a lot of episodes, but it's, you know, it's a good story and it's, it's worth actually going back. Um, there's a whole playlist on this channel. So make sure that you're there. And while you're there, please like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, do all that good stuff, because this is very much a labor of love for me. So if you could show some, some love back to my channel, I would really appreciate that. So, 17C, the account of the appearance of Cuchulain. Early the next morning, Cuchulain came to observe the host and to display his comely, beautiful form to the matrons and dames and girls and maidens and poets and men of art, for he did not consider it an honour nor becoming the wild, proud shape of magic which had been manifested to them the night before. So Cuchulain here is basically ashamed of the, um, the battle frenzy um, the magical otherworldly uh, rage shape that he took. It was for that then that he came to exhibit his comely beautiful form on that day. Truly fair was the youth that came there to display his form to the hosts, Cuchulain to it son of Sualtum. Three heads of hair he wore, brown at the skin, blood red in the middle, and a golden yellow crown what thatched it. Uh, we did have the unfortunate incident recently of a certain English author who works with Celtic shamanism who came onto a Facebook thread and decided to um, claim that there is nowhere in the mythology does it say what Ku Cullen's hair colour is. So let me just read that again, okay? Three heads of hair he wore, brown at the skin, blood red in the middle, a golden yellow crown that thatched it what thatched it rather. Beautiful was the arrangement of the hair with three coils of hair wound round the nape of his neck so that like to a strand of thread of gold was each thread like loose flowing, deep golden, magnificent, long tressed, splendid, beauteous hued hair as it fell down over his shoulders, a hundred bright purple windings of gold flaming red gold at his neck. A hundred salmon coloured, possibly, cords, strung with carbuncles as a covering around his head. Four spots on either of his two cheeks, even a yellow spot and a green spot and a blue spot and a purple spot. Not sure what that spotting on the cheeks is about. Um, it could be that his, you know, his skin has different hues to it, maybe. Um, but it doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, so if anybody knows what that's about, make sure that you uh, put it in the comments below. Seven jewels of the eye's brilliance was either of his kingly eyes. Seven toes to either of his two feet. This is where he's trying to show his normality, his comeliness. Seven fingers to either of his two hands with a clutch of hawk's claw with the grip of hedgehog's talon in every separate one of them. Grip of hedgehog's talon. <laughs> he also put on him that day his fair day dress. To this apparel about him belonged, namely, a beautiful, well-fitting, purple-fringed, five-folded mantle, a white brooch of silvered bronze or of white silver encrusted with burnished gold over his fair white breast, as if it were a full fulgent lantern that eyes of men could not behold for its resplendence and crystal shining. A striped chest jacket of silk on his skin, fairly adorned with borders and braidings and trimmings of gold and silver and silvered bronze. It reached to the upper hem of his dark brown, brown red, warlike breeches of royal silk. 
a magnificent brown purple buckler he wore with five wheels of gold on it with a rim of pure white silver around it a gold hilted hammered sword on his left side a long grey edged spear together with a trenchant by spear for defence with thongs for throwing and with rivets of whitened bronze alongside him in the chariot nine heads he bore in one of his hands and ten in the other and these he brandished before the hosts in token of his prowess and cunning Maeve hid her face beneath the shelter of shields lest Cucullan should cast at her that day so smart then it was that the maidens of Connacht besought the men of Erin to lift them up on the flat of the shields above the warrior's shoulders to behold the aspect of Cucullan for they marvelled at the beautiful comely appearance he showed them that day compared with the low arrogant shape of magic in which they had seen him the night before they're all looking for a peep show basically um, even when Cucullan is trying to be, you know, beautiful and comely, there is still otherworldly aspects to his appearance, such as the um, repetition of the sevens. Um, those would be signs and symbols, and the numerology was uh, was a big clue, really. Uh, certain numbers, threes and sevens and nines and fifties, for some reason. Um, they would uh, generally be numbers that were associated with magical or otherworldly things. Uh, I think I've said it before, but the idea of the three heads of hair he wore, and I don't belabor the point, it's a bit of a show in your arse now when this, uh, this person who claims to uh, teach Celtic shamanism and has actually done a lot of damage appropriation-wise and has herself and her husband have misconstrued quite a, a lot of, of our stuff now, to be honest, and have, you know, benefited quite significant from um the their appropriation of it but um but yeah she kind of showed her whole arse now by um not not knowing that not even not knowing i mean ignorance is is something that you know everybody you don't know what you don't know right but to come in and claim that there specifically wasn't without even maybe going and doing a basic checkup on it it uh, seems irresponsible at best. Um, but anyway, um, one of the explanations for that could be um, the idea of uh, basically bleaching the hair. Um, I have gone through a significant bleaching process myself to uh, get this lovely green hue that I am wearing today. But the um, when you bleach dark hair, uh, it will go red first, it'll go, you know, brown or black, it will go red and it will go uh, blonde eventually. So those are kind of three processes that it goes through. And one of the ideas that, um, that this could be is because um, they stiffened, warriors stiffened their hair with lime and lime will bleach your hair as well. So there is the other reference that we had the other day about um, the when he was in his warp spasm rage uh, his, his rage form he his hair stood up like needles and each of the needles could if you shook an it was something if you shook an apple tree um none of the apples would fall because they'd, they'd all get caught on the these these needle hairs that were spouting out of his head um that could also be a reference to this kind of stiffening of the hair with lime so obviously it's an exaggeration everything about cucullin is um, an exaggeration or you know extremes um, he is the absolute extreme example of everything and um, you know quite kind of unreal in his characterization because of that but his um, yeah so that could be a reference to all of that uh, it would make sense that he would be stiffening his hair with lime or that was because that was a very uh, well it's a pretty well-known practice um so anyway that's the appearance of Cucullin. we are going to get into dove talks jealousy so then it was that jealousy ill will and envy possessed dove talk dole the black tongue of ulster because of his wife in regard to Cucullin, and he counseled the host to act treacherously towards Cucullin and to entrap him even to lay up an ambush an ambush around him on all sides to the end that he might fall by them so this is the Ulster men who are now looking to turn on Cúchulainn. Uh, these are the ones that have been lying in their um, sick beds, uh, akin to women in the pangs of labour. 
and uh, they're back now and they are looking at Cucullin and jealous because their wives are wanting to see Cucullin in his uh, true form or his comely form as it was called. If this be the twisted one, sorry, and he spake these words. If this be the twisted one, by him shall men's bodies fall. Shrieks there shall be round the lists. Deeds to tell of shall be wrought. Uh, Lys is a fort, but it's specifically like an otherworldly fort. Um, Wrath would be another one that would be a fort. And Dune also, Dune would be more a mound maybe. Um, but Dune can also represent a fort. So shrieks there shall be around the list, deeds to tell of shall be wrought. Stones shall be on graves from him, kingly martyrs shall increase. Not well have ye battle found on the slopes with this wild hound. Now the wild man's form I see, nine of heads dangling by his side. Shattered spoils he has, behold, ten heads as his treasure great. And your women too I see, raise their heads above the line. I behold your puissant queen makes no move to engage in fight. That one's against Maeve, obviously. Were it mine to give advice, men would be on every side, that they soon might end his life, if this be the twisted one. So Fergus MacRoy heard this, and he deemed it an outrage that Dovetok should counsel how to betray Cuchulain to the hosts. And he reached him a strong, sharp kick with his foot away from him, so that Dovetok struck with his mouth against the group outside. And Fergus reproached him for all the wrongs and iniquities and treachery and shameful deeds he had ever done to the Ulster men of old and anew. Now, Fergus has done a fair bit of treachery himself so far. We did have somebody else saying that Fergus, um, again on Facebook somewhere, saying that Fergus was the only one in this story who was kind of acting honourably. Um, I don't think that's true. Uh, Fergus acts honourably when it fucking suits him. Um, but has no problem in betraying people who have been given him uh, support and safety. And, um, you know, when he's when he's an outcast from his own people, uh, Maeve took him in and he betrayed the fuck out of them. So um, that's Fergus. But anyway, this is him speaking these words. If this black tongue love talk be, let him skulk behind the hosts. No good hath he ever wrought since he slew the princesses. Base and foul the deed he wrought, fear who concours son he slew. Slew, slow, slow, slew. No more fair was heard of him, Carbra's death, Phelamine's son. Ne'er for Ulster's wealth doth aim, Lugga's son, Kasruba's scion. Such is how he acts to men, whom he stabs, not he incites. Ulster's exiles, it would grieve, if their beardless boy should fall. If on you come Ulster's troops, they will make their herds, your herds, their spoil. Strown afar your herds will be by the rising Ulster men. Tales there be of mighty deeds that will tell of fair famed queens. Corpses will be under foot, food there'll be at ravens' rests. Bucklers lying on the slopes, wild and furious deeds increase. Um, buckler is a shield. Um, or, well, actually, I think technically buckler is the the, the shield boss um, or it can be the the small kind of not a big shield but the small like defensive shield that just goes on your arm um, so anyway uh, bucklers lying on the slopes wild and furious deeds increase I behold just now your wives rise their heads above the ranks I behold your pussant uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing pussant correctly but uh, the, there we are um, moves not to engage in war. Um, valor none nor generous deed comes from Lugga's craven son, nor will kings see lances red if this black tongue doth talk be. Thus far the scythe chariot. So the scythe chariot reference is to 17b, the part here. Um, so we've gone through all of 17 there and we're going to leave that for today. Um, the next one is the slaying of Angus, son of Onlum, Onluf, Onluf. And then we have the misthrow at Balach Owen, the disguising of Tamlin. And um, then we get into the Battle of Fergus and Cuchulain and all that. So 
um, looking ahead there, the combat of Calatin's children and the Bive is definitely involved in that. Um, and we've got Ferdi and Cuchulain and all that saga. Still quite a lot um, to come. So stay tuned. Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel and you don't miss any of the notifications. Um, because I am trying to do weekly content on the Tawn. I'm doing weekly content on the channel, definitely. And uh, generally, the videos are coming out on Wednesdays, Fridays and Sundays. Uh, sometimes there's a blog instead of a video. So if you have missed a video on one of those days, uh, go over to laurelbryan.ie and check out the blog because there'll be something interesting there. And I think I'm going to keep this going through September because it seems to be working quite well. So we will um, we'll definitely keep up with the Tawn. We'll go through that. I did find a different version of the Tawn Faraday's that is available. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to have a read through. I'm going to have a, a little skim through it. And um, I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering if I uh, if I might kick into doing it again. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. So, okay. So, uh, Slongafall, and I will see you in the next video.